Reynolds Journalism Institute, welcome to Global Journalist. I'm Jason McClure. You see them on the battlefields, patrolling the front lines, risking their lives. But they're not soldiers, at least not in the traditional sense. They're war correspondents. These brave men and women travel to the most dangerous parts of the globe, all for the story. For many journalists covering one, war is enough. But there's a small group of reporters and photographers who have made it their career to jump from one war to another. But how do they even decide they want to do this? And after years of bullets and bad sleeping quarters, bearing witness to destruction and death, how do they keep going? On this edition of Global Journalist, we'll hear one man's story. Joining me today from South Carolina is David Axe. He's a 37-year-old war correspondent who has made a career of covering the world's worst conflicts, including Somalia, Iraq, Afghanistan, and the Democratic Republic of Congo. His work has appeared in numerous news outlets, and he's published a number of books, including the graphical novels War is Boring, War Fix, and Army of God. He's the founder and editor of an online collective of national security journalists, also called War is Boring. Axe is the subject of a new documentary called War Passenger, which is out now on Vimeo and other online video sites. It's directed by Robert Watson. He joins us here in the studio now. Gentlemen, thank you both so much for joining us. David Axe, I understand you're just back from Syria, but let's, let's start at the beginning. Uh, you got a master's degree back in 2004, went to work for an alternative weekly paper in South Carolina covering local politics and somehow seemed unfulfilled with your life. Tell us, tell us what happened. Uh, well, that, that, that sums it up. I was uh, out of grad school. I was a, uh, uh, a beat reporter for uh, the Free Times in Columbia, South Carolina, covering Richland County politics. And it was mostly zoning and uh, bickering council members. And it was, uh, it was pretty boring. So uh, I, I had always wanted, or I'd always had an interest in um, <clears throat> military history and, uh, and war, um, sort of in an academic sense. Uh, at the time, this would be late 2004, the uh, South Carolina Army National Guard, it was their turn to, uh, to go to Iraq. Uh, so thousands of them deployed. And uh, this struck me as an opportunity. You know, here I am, a, a reporter who I thought uh, was wasting his talent uh, covering, uh, <laughs> covering county politics. Uh, and uh, a bunch of my fellow South Carolinians were headed off to war. So I should uh, I should go along with them because I was totally into war. Uh, it was it was a pretty naive view, uh, both of um, you know the implications of uh, jaunting off to a war zone, but also my own uh, readiness, my own preparedness to uh, to actually do that work and do it well. But uh, off I went, and uh, well, fast forward eight years, I was I was still doing it. I should point out uh, now twenty. 15, I'm retired. The last time that I, I went to a war zone was in late 2013 to Syria, and uh, that that was uh, that was about enough. So I, I haven't gone anywhere in a year and a half, and uh, no plans. Uh, assuming that kind of work. Well, tell me, tell me if you would then. You know, this film War Passenger, it. It, it features you talking about how that first trip to Iraq, a lot of it, a lot of the time you spent there was quite boring. You were the trucking company, not much was happening. The, you know, the soldiers you were with weren't under fire. And then you were embedded with an army infantry unit in a town called Bakuba. Tell us what happened there. Right, so I spent the first half of that first trip uh, to Iraq running uh, supplies with a transportation company up and down Iraq. Uh, South Carolina Guard Company, and um, it was actually that's fairly dangerous. That was at the time fairly dangerous duty. Hundreds of those guys had been blown up in roadside bombs, uh, but uh, you know, I I guess I got lucky or unlucky, depending on what you were trying to get out of the experience, and uh, nothing much happened. So uh, I was kind of frustrated and yes, bored. Uh, I hopped over to uh, to an active duty unit, the uh, First Infantry Division. In, uh, in Bakuba, which is a, a nasty little town in the Sunni Triangle in north, north central Iraq. And it was, uh, it was the very opposite of, uh, of boring. Uh, I mean, maybe, maybe a day after I arrived, the, uh, the army 
hosted what they called a peace day, uh, basically offering amnesty to insurgents. This is when insurgents uh, could come and bring in their weapons and yeah, you bring turn in them over to the U.S. Won't arrest you, right? So, uh, which sounds like a great idea, but you have to um, tell them where to meet you. So uh, basically, you're telling the you're telling the bad guys where you're going to be and when. So uh, of course, they got blown up in a bomb. Uh, car bomb exploded right outside the building. I was inside with some other reporters and some uh, local government officials and some army officers. Uh, and then there was just, you know, blood and guts and pandemonium. Uh, some Iraqi cops were either wounded or killed. I don't know. I, I saw the blood trails as they dragged the bodies away. Uh, and the suicide bomber was pulverized, bits and pieces of him lying around. So that was like right off the bat, uh, just about the most horrific thing that could happen. That was sort of your baptism uh, by fire, if you will. Sure. Yeah. Well, well, Robert, let me ask you this. Tell us, <laughs> tell us first, um, how did you get interested in making a film about uh, David's life? Well, I, um, I saw a small review on his um, graphic novel that was released, I believe it was about 2010 or so, um, in Rolling Stone. Um, just read a little blurb on it, and I'd always been interested in comic books as a medium. And I thought, hey, that sounds interesting, you know, this autobiographical journalistic comic, which... There have been people that have done that that kind of feel before, but this was my first exposure to it anyway. So I, you know, I ordered the comic and I was just you know pretty much blown away by it. I just thought it was a a, a really great piece of work. I mean, the you know David's writing, um, the artist Matt Bohr's art. Um, it was quirky and funny, and then dramatic and violent, all kind of pieced together in this really engaging engaging piece of piece of oh, piece of work. And uh, so anyway, I, I thought, well, you know this. This works as a comic. I think it would work as a film. Um, found David's contact information, you know, dropped him an email, and he was somewhat receptive to the idea. And so I um, flew out to meet him, and you know, he was very engaging. And I thought this could work. You know, I think he would be a be a good subject for a film. And David, if I could just move you back, then. So after your sort of first tour in Iraq, you came back to. South Carolina. Presumably, you could have just moved back into your old life working at the newspaper or a different publication or moved to a bigger city in the U.S., but something inside you had changed. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah, some, something had changed. Or maybe that that time in Bakuba, uh, it, it satisfied a kind of cliche expectation of what war should be. Um, you know, gunfire and explosions and running around and, uh, um, that is pretty addictive. I mean, literally addictive in a chemical sense, uh, in a way that driving a truck up and down a highway in Iraq isn't, um, I, I'm not sure that I cra craved, uh, you know, another, uh, suicide bombing, but, uh, I'd, I'd had enough taste of excitement that I thought maybe that's what this would be like uh, if I if I kept at it. Um, also, it, it I giving myself the benefit of the doubt, which is probably not fair, actually, um, I, I was a very inexperienced, a very young, inexperienced journalist going into this field, uh, knew that I could do better work. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it, it's uh, it's useful to specialize as a journalist. I think I sensed that. Um, so, you know, if I was going to be a war journalist, or if I was going to be a, a good journalist, I should um, follow my passion, follow my interests, and stick with this, and uh, try to get good at it. Uh, I think if I had if I had moved to another publication, I would have started over, and um, I would have felt like I'd missed an opportunity. If we flash forward to 2007, this is a year when you spent the year in Iraq, in Lebanon, East Timor, Afghanistan, Somalia, and then Iraq again. And when you got back, you talk about being, you know, at least in the film, you talk about being not really right. You were broke, you were exhausted, you moved back in with your parents in South Carolina. You talk about how hard it is to come home, and, and we have a clip of that, actually. Here's what you had to say. It's, uh, it's really not easy coming home from from a war zone back to peaceful life because everything is so different here. When I, 
The first time I came back from Iraq was the hardest. It got easier and easier to come home in the sense that I knew what to expect. Not that the emotional experience was any different, but it just wasn't as much of a surprise. So you find yourself in a war zone. Uh, even when there's not immediate danger, there's a tension, there's a constant tension in the air, so to speak, that shapes, that influences the way you do everything, the way you think, the way you move, the way you talk to people. Uh, the whole world, the physics of the whole world sort of shift about 15 degrees towards crazy. It's like, uh, it's subtle. It's subtle enough that you don't notice it happening necessarily when you're in, in a conflict zone. You know, one of the other things that David says during the filming, the hardest part was living in the physical world, a world that's not trying to kill you, at least not trying as hard. Can you explain what you think he meant by that? Well, I think, you know, I think David had, had traveled enough and, and seen enough of the world that, and realized that, you know, most people in America, the vast majority are, are somewhat insulated and unaware of how things really are out there. And, you know, and I think that frustrated him to an extent and that, you know, he, you know, it's not an individual's fault that they don't know, you know, every circumstance is happening in third world countries, you know, everywhere else in the world. But, you know, at the same time, he, you know, he, I think he did feel some resentment um, just because he had seen these things and, you know, and then coming back and, and hearing what people thought was necessarily very important to them or a big deal to them. And he realized that, in, you know, in the whole scheme of things, this is, this is not a big deal when you take into account what's, what's happening around the world. And David asks, respond if you would. I mean, you talk about the world shifting 15 degrees toward crazy and then there being a, an adjustment period when you come back. Now, it's been almost two years since you were in your last conflict zone. You said back in Syria, uh, I think it was. Tell us, tell us a little bit how the world seems now to you in the United States. Look, so, I, okay, you know, you're, you're 26. You're not good at anything. You don't know. You don't know anything. You don't have anything. Um, you, you fly off to a war zone and, um, sure it's dangerous and people are dying and, uh, and it, it seems like you've entered into a, some sort of parallel universe or worse, it seems like you finally discovered the real world, but that's, 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 that's bull. Uh, that's not the real world. Any any more than this is the real world. It's no less the real world than, you know, sitting in my living room with my cats is, is the real world. This is the same world. I mean, is it news to anyone that we live in a world that has some war in it? It shouldn't be. And if, it, if, if for me that was shocking, then I was silly. I was a silly little boy. Uh, so I, I know better now. Yes, there's war in the world. There's always been war in the world. It's not magic. It doesn't fall out of the sky. It's something we do. It's politics. I mean, it's the it's the bloodiest, raggediest edge of politics, but it's still just politics. We go to war for reasons that, you know, historians and policymakers usually pretty much understand. Uh, and the idea that I, I, when I was younger, I imagined that I was, I was teleporting back and forth between two different worlds. And I, I don't know, maybe, yeah, I, I thought the, the war world was more real or something because, uh, you know, because it was so extraordinary and so smelly and dangerous and loud. Uh, but uh, th that's, that's just naive. I know better now. And to that, that, that idea that, that war is the real world is, is vain. It's vain for a soldier or for a war reporter to believe that. Um, the reason that I wanted to believe that is that so, that I, so that I could come home and be a dysfunctional jerk and blame it on, not blame it, but attribute it to my authenticity because I'm a war reporter. I've seen the real world. You don't know what it's like out there, which is just 
BS. This is Global Journalist. I'm Jason McClure. Joining me today is David Axe, a war correspondent who's traveled around the globe since 2005, covering conflicts in Afghanistan, Chad, and Iraq, among others. He's the subject of the documentary War Passenger. Also joining us in the studio is the director of that film, Robert Watson. If you're interested in more Global Journalist content, visit us online at globaljournalist.org. There you can read in-depth articles on international affairs and free press issues and download past episodes from our archive. We're also on social media. You can like us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter at Global Journ. Robert Watson, in the film War Passenger, you have lots of archival footage from David's career as a journalist. And you also have David talking about sort of his view of war when he started out and that his interest in war was non-political, that he was in it for the action, sort of the spiritual aspect of what happened on the ground when people set out to kill each other. It's almost like he viewed it as sort of a shooter video game. But then sort of later in the film, he says, not anymore. What, what do you see that changed in his outlook? Well, I, you know, that's, that's tough to say, and, and I'm sure David would be able to shed, shed light on that. But, you know, I, you know, I do think it would be hard not to get cynical. Um, you know, just go, the, the process of going back and forth to a war zone, I'm sure, you know, has to change your outlook on things, and, and I think it has. Yeah, um, but I, I would but I think, respectfully disagree with Robert. Uh, it, I didn't get more cynical. I got less. Uh, because I, going into my career as a war correspondent, I could not have been more cynical because all I cared about was could this be fun? Could I get some sexy photographs? Could I tell great stories in the bar back home? Um, and you know, would I would I come home with depths of understanding about the universe that would make me I don't know better and more mysterious than uh, than uh, than everyone else around me? Could I wear my my thousand yard stare and uh, and I don't know put it up as a shield against all the people around me I didn't want to talk to that cynicism um, I, I, I gratefully I'm thankfully I, I grew up and sympathized at least somewhat with with the people who don't have the choice to go home from war people who live in these places live in these war zones people to whom war happens people who don't choose it. Uh, these people, um, they're, they're the ones who really matter in all of this. Uh, and um, so I, I became less cynical in that I began to actually care about the victims of war, thank God, because what would it say about me if I hadn't? Well, Robert Watson, one of David's early graphic novels was called War Fix. And you know, there's this character in it that talks about the excitement and tension of covering a war as being like a narcotic, something that produces a high that you sort of then feel compelled to keep chasing and chasing and chasing again. And did you get that sense of David as you were making this film a couple of years ago? That this was something that he couldn't stop doing. Well, I think I think he was almost past that point when I probably when I started making the movie. Um, he, he was not traveling quite as much. You know, when that, that graphic novel came out, you know, several years prior um, to me beginning the film. And, and like I said, I think he had a different viewpoint about his traveling at that point. He had, it, it had shifted in kind of into career mode. Um, he had, you know, he had it more lined out on his various media sources and how to, the logistics of planning his trips. Um, so I think that that, you know, that particular graphic novel is probably more representative of David at the beginning of his war correspondent career more than when I started the film. David, let me just ask you one thing that I was really curious about as I was watching this film about your career was how, how did you pay for all this? How did, you, how did you finance all this to go to all these different places, Afghanistan, Iraq, East Timor, the Democratic Republic of Congo? These are extraordinarily remote, dangerous places to get to. It costs a lot of money. MasterCard. And does, so who pays the MasterCard bill? Well, I do now. <laughs> I, I, I got lucky. I mean, I, I viewed... I, I, I assumed one of two things, and I'm not sure which one's actually true. Maybe it was a mix. One, that I would die, and it wouldn't matter if I had a bunch of debt, or two, that I would get good at my job and make more money and be able to pay it off. I didn't die. 
as a viewer of the film, when you see it, you know, actually one of your friends is quoted as saying, David's not going to stop. He's basically addicted to doing this. The only thing that is going to stop him is if wars end or if he takes a bullet, basically. Um, how, how, did you, how did you stop this sort of chasing of conflict zones? Uh, I grew up. And, and I also realized, look, a war correspondent has a life expectancy. And I actually sat down and calculated it one day based on everyone I knew and how long they lasted. I, uh, I, I estimated that you get about eight years before you um, get killed, uh, get badly hurt, or go crazy. And the alternative is to quit. So you quit before eight years or you're done in a, you know, a more cosmic sense. So, uh, I mean, you talk in the film, actually, you have this great quote where you're talking about, you know, a soldier once told you that courage is like a bank account uh, and that some people have b bigger accounts than others, but eventually you sort of run out if you're continually in these situations. I mean, is it, did your account just run out? Absolutely. Yeah, I, I can't do this kind of work anymore, even if I wanted to, even if there was some part of me that wanted to. Uh, I can't. I, I, I can't function. I'm too old. I'm too scared. I, I have too many things in my life now that I that I love and uh, that I would like to preserve. I like living now. Robert Watson, I wanted to ask you about one particularly sort of graphic, compelling portion of this film, and this is when David is talking about an incident that happens to him in sort of a remote part of Chad near the border of Sudan's Darfur region while he was covering that conflict there a couple of years ago. Tell us just a little bit about that. Yeah, he, um, he went to Chad, I think that was 2007, possibly. Eight. Uh, 2008, okay. Yep. And, um, you know, and I think that was, I think that part of Africa was probably quite a bit different than his travels to Iraq and Afghanistan when he was embedded with um, the U.S. military or various military. He was, I think he was pretty much on his own in Chad. Um, and, yeah, there was a particularly harrowing incident in the middle of the night. Um, there were shots being fired, um, and David made a conscious decision, I'm going to go outside my room and see what's going on. And so he went towards the gunfire, um, got in with some child soldiers, things turned south from there, um, ended up getting kidnapped by um, another military group. Um, and, and yeah, it was just, that, that's... That's one of the best the best segments of the film, I think. He, it's just, uh, and it's also a great segment in, in War is Boring, his graphic novel, um, where he just talks about kind of in his head making that decision that, you know, most people would decide, uh, you know, you hear danger happening, I'm going to stay in my room. And instead he made a conscious decision, no, I'm going to go, I'm going to walk towards it and see what's happening. And, and luckily he made it out alive. No, I didn't. So we, my photographer and I were in our little, we had rented a room in a, in a, in a, in a Catholic mission, actually, and so we were sweltering in the heat when this battle suddenly broke out in a town called Abishé on the border with, uh, with Darfur. And uh, to this day, I don't think anyone knows, well, I don't know. What, who was actually shooting at whom and why. Um, from my point of view, it just looked like the Chadian army running around like a bunch of crazy people shooting at everything. And, uh, um, you know, you could look outside and see the explosions and the rockets and the tracers. Uh, and I said, well, we have to go, we have to go out there. And my photographer said, no way. And, uh, so I went on my own, climbed over the fence because they'd locked us in, and uh, dropped down onto this dusty street, uh, maybe a hundred yards down the road was an intersection. And there seemed to be some sort of battle going on in that intersection with just the flashes of light and the noise and the blasts and the, it was just, it was like looking into the end of the world uh, is what it felt like. Uh, and I, I, I had this moment, and it was, it was one of those weird moments where something really profound happens and you're aware that something really profound is happening, which I think is rare. I knew that if I went to the intersection, the only way that I was going to, to, to understand this experience and understand what was happening um, 
and understand. I, I, I felt like this moment was, it distilled everything that I'd been um, chasing and, and experiencing for, for years now. I, the only way I was going to understand all of that is if I, if I walked into that intersection. But I also knew that if I walked into that intersection, I would die. And so I sat there crouching in the dust and made a decision. Uh, do I go or do I stay? And I went. I made a decision to stand up and walk into my death. And I, I, it's, it sounds silly, uh, and I'm sure lots of people who've had um, traumatic experiences will find this disgusting, but I, I, I died. I walked into that intersection and I died. Uh, I am not the same person that I was before I walked into that intersection. Uh, the old David died. Yeah. Well, or I'm dead now. I mean, I've, I'm dead. I don't... I can make tactical decisions about where I go and I, uh, you know, I, I can explain to you that I own things now and I have a relationship and I have cats and I, I don't want to travel anymore because it's too dangerous and I'm too old. But the truth is that None of that really matters, and nothing has mattered. Nothing has felt like anything. There's a, I, something ended that night in that intersection that has, um, that has defined the rest of my life. Uh, and I, yeah, I'm probably not going to go back to war, and I'm going to live out the rest of my life as an editor or a writer, or doing things, doing peaceful things, writing about peaceful things. Uh, and that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. But in in one way that really matters, I am already dead. I died at the age of 28 in Abishai Chad. I mean, I'm I'm really hard to hurt now emotionally because I don't really care anymore. <laughs> uh, I'm hard to scare because, uh, I don't know, either I'm never going to be scared again or I'm always so scared that I can't tell the difference between this and not. Um, I got what I wanted in that intersection and uh, it was really, really awful. That'll do it for this edition of Global Journalist, a production of the Reynolds Journalism Institute and the Missouri School of Journalism. Many thanks to Robert Watson and David Axe for joining us. Robert's documentary of David, War Passenger, is available online. You can go to warpassenger.com or Vimeo for more information. Global Journalist's executive producer is Joshua Kranzberg. Our studio director is Travis McMillan from RJI. And our audio engineer is Pat Akers of KBIA. For all of us at Global Journalist, I'm Jason McClure. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time.